everybody, welcome, welcome to Bible study this morning. It is so wonderful to be here, as always, to be together as a group of ladies, um, just to be around the Word of God. Isn't that a privilege? And it is wonderful. It is um, a breath of fresh air for me. I was saying to my friend Leanne that it really is a breath of fresh air. She said to me, don't you want to maybe take a break today with what we've gone through with my, my dad recently? And I said, no, <laughs> I don't want a break. This is my breath of fresh air. This is my, um, my sustenance. This is my food. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here with me as I get to enjoy eating the Word of God today. And I hope you all enjoy your meal today as well with me. So before we get into the study, let's start with our Bible trivia. As I say every week with this study, or as we're doing this fun time, um, we are just doing some fun Bible trivia, getting to know the Word of God on, 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 on a fun level, reading, maybe learning one or two things that you didn't know as far as trivia is concerned. And it may or may not be included in a Bible trivia quiz that we will oh. maybe or may not do <laughs> sometime or the other, which there may or may not be a prize at the end of all of this. <laughs> I say that each time. So that's just for fun, for those of us who are live with us each week. Good morning, Pauline. She's just going to come sit down and then we're going to get started. Hello, Pauline. Your coffee is waiting for you. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome. All right, Bible trivia question number one. What job did Simon Peter do before following Jesus? It's a very easy one. Fisherman. That's right. Look at all of you. Ging, 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 ging. Bible study ladies. He was a fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. How many days was Lazarus dead for before Jesus raised him? How many days was three. he dead? I also thought it was three, but it wasn't. You said but. It was four days. Yeah. Lazarus was dead for four days, stinky, stinky, mm. by the time <laughs> Jesus raised him from the dead. Okay, who is considered as the 13th disciple who replaced Judas? He's considered, he's not like the official disciple, but he's considered as the 13th disciple. Does anybody know what his name is? No? No? It starts with the letter M. Um, Michael. No. <laughs> we could probably go through all the M's. Does anybody online want to take a take a guess at that without Googling? You know, if this is like who wants to be a millionaire. I hope that there is an adjudicator there watching you and you're not cheating on Google. Does anyone online online want to give it a give it a go? Not okay. The thirteenth disciple was a Matthias. He's classified as a thirteenth disciple. Yes. Okay, what does the word Israel mean? The word um, Israel, what does it actually mean? Um, Anyone have any idea? Anyone online want to give it a shot? Um, Not? I hope it is. Sorry, say that again? Is it not Jesus? No, it's not. But beautiful, Jesus is, <coughs> Jesus is everything. I will tell you. How's about I tell you? Israel actually means prevails with God. Oh, wow. Interesting, <laughs> hey? Prevails with God. And I, I love I love what that means because it's not prevails on its own, prevails with God. So wherever Israel is, God is because Israel prevails with God. Interesting thought. Okay, this is something that we all should know. How many humans were on the ark with Noah, including Noah? How many humans were there in total? Hmm. There were a lot of animals, but how many four. humans? Seven. Nope, not four, not seven. Eight! Molly! Eight! And Noah and his wife. There we go. There were eight humans on Noah's ark. There we go. So that's for some Bible trivia just for fun today as we get started with our anchor scripture. Anchor scripture, ladies, for this year is Luke chapter 11, verse 28. This is a scripture I was actually uh, quoting and speaking out on the evening of my dad being admitted into hospital. And you know, it was a Saturday evening. It was, you would expect the emergency room to be busy. It was not. There wasn't a single other person in the, in the ER. Isn't that remarkable? Sure, so it was sure. so yeah. quiet. Um, so, so which was a blessing because we could, uh, you know, expedite everything quite quickly. And while my dad was having one of his scans done, I was walking up and down the corridor, quoting the scripture. And the reason this scripture 
is because I couldn't think of anything else. And I'm being honest with you. My mind hit a blank. <laughs> Me, I hit a blank. I'm like, okay, Lord, I need to speak your word over this situation. I'm like, I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. And then the, the anchor scriptures, the, the, the word that actually came up. And, and I think that was intentional. I think the Holy Spirit led it that way. But Luke chapter 11, verse 28 says what? Say it with me. But even more blessed are all those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. But even more blessed. This word blessed, I was pondering a bit on it again over the last week. Makarios is the Greek word. Let's say it together. Makarios. Such a nice word to say, don't you think? It just makes you feel... European. <laughs> Makes you feel like you go on holidays with the girls. Makarios. One on this. It's just a fun word to say. But Makarios actually is is put it's in the word in the New Testament over fifty times. This word blessed. But now Makarios is directly translated as happy. I've done we did a whole study in this right in the beginning of the year. But just wanted to expand it a little bit for you. So this word happy actually the, when, when the Greek people used it to explain a person or a situation, they were saying this person enjoys the, a privilege of some kind. So if you say to someone, you, you are makarios, you are blessed, it means you are, you are privileged of some kind. There, there's something about you that makes you privileged in a certain situation. Your position is desirable. So if you say to someone, you are makarios, it means your position, the position you are in, is something I desire. It's so desirable. And that's why the Amplified Version uses the word envied or fortunate to be happy. Those type of words. It it's really gives a sense of a deep-rooted happiness. Deep-rooted contentment. Irrespective of your circumstance. That is makarios. But even more blessed, even more makarios are all those, that's us, who hear God's word and who put it into practice. I really love that word. Isn't it beautiful? Makarios. You can say that to yourself and you can say that in any situation in your life when you find yourself in a, in a, in a, in a corridor walking at midnight across the CT scan halls. You can say, I am makarios. I am blessed. Despite the circumstance, I am makarios. God's blessing is in this area. I am positioned to be favored by God. I have full contentment in the circumstance, irrespective of what I am experiencing. That is our anchor scripture. It's a powerful scripture. It might seem simple to you at first, but the more we, we say it, the more we, we examine it each week, you actually get that, that, the essence of how full this anchor scripture is. Let us, um, let us pray as we get into today's study. Father God, we thank you that we can come to you in the powerful name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here. This whole study is really about you, Holy Spirit. So I thank you that as I deliver this word, that you will be all over it and that you will speak through me, that you will say exactly what you want to say in my heart that will be delivered through my mouth. And I pray that this time together in your word will just be makarios, will be blessed, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So hearing the word is something that we say is always quite easy to do. It's the doing part where we need help and that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And we say, thank you, Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit. Sure. Mm -hmm. So grateful for him. Who is the Holy Spirit? <coughs> Who is he? He is God. God. Holy Spirit is God. He's not <laughs> half God. He's not half God. He is God. We believe in the triune fashion. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is God. And why do we have him? Because Jesus said we need help. See, these people need help. Don't you sometimes feel like, I need help? Yes, I feel that often. All the time, every day of my life. <laughs> I need help. And the Holy Spirit is like, it's okay, I'm here. I'm here. That's my job. I'm here to help. How can I help, he says. That is his job. That's why the Holy Spirit, that's why Jesus sent him to us. Ask the Father, can you please send the Holy Spirit? They need him. When do we receive the Holy Spirit? At the moment of salvation. At the moment you accept Jesus, woof, the Holy Spirit comes and he dwells within you. And his responsibility is to be your paraclete. He's the paraclete toss. He comes alongside you and fulfills all these wonderful roles of being the comforter and the strengthener and your standby and your counselor and your coach and your advocate and your intercessor. 
just add in one more person. He, he fulfills all these beautiful roles in our lives that we so desperately need. And most importantly, he helps us to look like Jesus. I want us to go read in John chapter 15, verse 4. We read this very, very many ses sessions ago. And often I just make reference to it, but I want to read it to you again today. John 15, verse 4. This is where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, etc. Verse 4. Dwell in me, Jesus says, and I will dwell in you. Live in me and I will live in you, the Amplified Version expands. How are we to dwell in Jesus when he's sitting at the right hand of the Father? I, I say this every week because I want you to remember it all the time. How is it possible? We know Jesus has left earth. He's ascended. He's in heaven right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's our great high priest. He is with the Father in heaven. How are we supposed to dwell in him? Through the Holy Spirit. It's the only way that is possible. Then it says, just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in and being vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. So Jesus is saying, in order for you to produce fruit, in other words, in order for you to start having the character that my character resembles, you have to abide in me through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. That is what we are talking about here. We, we did this, the full ex, uh, extent of the study right in the beginning of this whole session. So please go back and check it out. I think it was session one or session two. So that is what the Holy Spirit does. He comes into our life to help us abide with Jesus, to start transforming our character to look like Jesus, which is fruit. The fruit that we talk about is the character of God, the character of Jesus. And then in Galatians 5, verse 22, we've read this also many times. As a matter of fact, let's read it again, because it has been a little while talking about how his presence accomplishes much. But let me read it for you. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 says this. All right. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes, is, and then it goes and lists them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, etc. So the presence of, of the Holy Spirit within us accomplishes this. His presence in us gets the job done. Isn't that wonderful? That we know that we have the Holy Spirit to actually make this all happen within us. Because we can't do this on our own. There's no ways that we can start looking like Jesus and start having the character of Jesus on our own. We can't. It's just not possible. We need help. We need the Holy Spirit. So we've had a look at some of the fruits already. We've already had a look at it. We've looked at love, which is really the foundation of all the fruits, I would say. We've looked at joy, which I like to summarize as your strength to victory. If you need victory in your life, you need joy. <laughs> we looked at peace, which I believe is a weapon which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. Peace is actually a weapon. The fruit of peace in your life is, is something that comes and barricades your heart and protects your heart and stops any assault from the enemy from coming in and affecting you permanently. That's what peace does. Patience, the fruit of patience in your life, pauses anger. Mm, should we do that study all over again? <laughs> Who feels we need to do it again? The, 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 that's what, what the fruit of goodness and uh, uh, patience does pauses anger and in the last session we looked at kindness and kindness the fruits of kindness shows god's love through action it's us showing god's love through action which ultimately leads people to jesus that's what the fruit of kindness is in our life and all of these characteristics are the characteristics of god the father god the son god the holy spirit and ultimately you and me that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's working within us to let all of these characteristics start resembling and becoming loud in us. And we start looking less like us and a whole lot more like the Lord. And that's what we certainly need. That's what I need. Now I've got a question for you before we get into today's specific fruit. Have you realized that as the Holy Spirit starts working in your life, that your character is being transformed? Is it visible to you? Are you starting to see things? that there are, there's like a shift that's taking place. As you actually recognize the Holy Spirit, and as Galatians talks about how you healed to him, and you're walking in the Spirit, so you're saying no to the flesh, and you're choosing what the Word of God says over and above, what you are 
feeling. Have you noticed how there's actually a transformation that is coming? We spoke about this transformation in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's a beautiful scripture, so I'm going to read it again. Because it's necessary. Repetition, repetition, repetition. It's powerful. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, and, let me just get my angle right so I can read it. <laughs> and all of us, as of unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the word of God as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into his very own image, in ever-increasing splendor, and from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what the scripture is saying, that we are being transformed one degree to the other, one step to the, in, in, to the, to the next, we are being transformed to start looking like the Lord, to start looking like the character of God and his ways of doing things. Where once upon a time, sin may have been comfortable for you. It may have been a comfortable part of your life as we abide in Jesus through the Holy Spirit, John 15 verse 4, as we abide in Jesus, sin starts to become uncomfortable. Where it once was easy, now it starts becoming uncomfortable. I'm going to give you an example, and this is all leading us to the next fruit. Let me give you an example. Many years ago, um, in that time of my husband and my life, when we still filmed weddings. No, we do not do that anymore. Please don't send me any requests to film any weddings. That is bygones. <laughs> there was a time we filmed a lot of weddings. That's what we, we are videographers, that's what we do in our business. Um, and uh, I, love, I love weddings, and I love marriage, of course. I just don't like filming them anymore. <laughs> but anyway, there was a time that we did this, and one of the, the weddings that we filmed, I, I found this couple to be very intriguing. They were middle age, middle age going a little bit beyond middle age, you know, middle, and you're just like kind of stepping over to that other side. And they were a beautiful couple, and you could clearly see they were besotted with one another. They loved each other. So I thought it was like young love. Young love in an older form, you know? And as I started speaking to them, so we started trying to discover, um, you, know, you know, how you want your wedding to be filmed, and all those type of things that we ask couples that we used to, we don't do it anymore, because we don't do that anymore. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, just remind me, just remind me. <laughs> so, as we speak to them, I discovered this couple's actually been together for like 20 years. They've been together for ages, and they've been living together for so many years. I'm like, so me being me, because I'm inquisitive and I ask questions, um, so I'm like, so why are you getting married now? If you've been married, if you've been living together for so long, what caused you to get married, like now? And then the lady said to me, she said, you know, my husband, my, my fiance and I, we, we always knew the Lord when we were younger. And, but then life happened and we strayed away from God. We just, you know, we just kind of did our own thing and we, we, we walked our own path straight away from the Lord. We started living together um, as a husband and wife do. And they never had any children. Um, and so, and, and things were fine. There wasn't a problem. They were enjoying life. They were successful. They were doing well. And then one day, they decided maybe they should go back to church. Just go visit church. They haven't been there for a long time. Let's go visit church. So they went back to church, and this is also what a side note, you know, if there's a column in a, in a, in a book, this is the side note. Going to church is really important. <laughs> so, side note. So, they decided, you know, they want to go to church. They want to find a church that they're comfortable at, and they just want to go and visit church. So they went to church. And they really enjoyed this church. Wow, it's great, you know, awesome and going together, wonderful. They loved this. They, they recommitted their lives to the Lord. That was an important thing to say. They realized they had backslidden. They recommitted their life to the Lord. Um, and they were just really loving life, loving God, joined a life group, loving each other. Everything was going good until one day she looked at him and she's like, I don't think we should be living together. And he's like, oh, what do you mean you don't love me? He's like, no, I love you with all my heart. But well, this isn't right. What you're doing is not right. Please take note. They, no one told them that. Because I asked her, because I'm inquisitive, and I asked these questions. I said, did anyone in your life group say to you it's not right that you're living together without being married? And she said, not one person told us that. I'm like, hey, which life group are you going to? <laughs> that life group leader is maybe loving you slowly to, to, to truth. I'm not sure which one it is. 
But I'm just like, no one said this to me. So I said, so what made you decide this after 20 years of living together? And she said, I don't know. I just started feeling uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Hmm, really? Oh, okay, this is interesting. She just started feeling uncomfortable. So her and her, her partner started talking about it. So they decided they were going to sleep in different bedrooms mm -hmm. in the same house. If you love one another, you know that's not going to happen for long, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's face it, it gets a bit cold. Ach, Leafy, come back. I'm missing your boat. You know? <laughs> you know what it's like, right? So that didn't last long, and kind of things went back to normal. And then they went to church one day, and the pastor from the stage made a comment. And he said, I feel the Lord is, is urging me to say something. And to say, if you are living together and you are not married, you are going against what the word of God says. And both of them were like, <laughs> But what I find intriguing by the story is that the Holy Spirit had already started pruning their hearts. It already started working within them. There was something already stirring within them. So then they made a decision that they were going to move out of the house. One of them left. I can't remember now which one it was. I think it was the man. And they were going to stay apart and they, just, they needed to get married quickly. And they got married in two weeks. Mm -hmm. From that decision, they're like, we need to get married, we need to film this, we need to do everything. And they got married. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? So it's an amazing story. I find it quite amazing. You see, what was happening in their lives at this point? In that moment, you see, the Holy Spirit in our lives, when we are yielding to Him, the Holy Spirit leads you to godliness. He leads you to godliness. Remember, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is He convicts us. You know, he, that when you, if you go look back at the study when we spoke about his roles, one of it is he convicts us. He convicts the sinner to repentance, but he convicts the believer to righteousness. So when you've committed your life to the Lord, he is, he's constantly saying, you know, that's what we should actually be doing. We should rather be doing that, Trace. This isn't quite the right way of handling it. Let's rather focus on this. No, the way that you responded is not right. Let's, let's focus this way because he's our coach and he's our leader and he, and he leads us in all truth. So when he's within us, when you're abiding your life to, to the Holy Spirit, he leads you to godliness. He starts leading you to live a life of righteousness. Now this couple is a perfect example of the next fruits. And I've done a very long introduction to all of this, but it's a good way to lead up to it. And the next fruit we are looking at is the fruit of goodness. The fruit of goodness that is being produced in us. I like to say this about the fruit of goodness. The fruit of goodness leads us to a lifestyle of godliness. The fruit of goodness in your life leads us to a lifestyle of godliness. That's what goodness does. Let's get into the Greek. The Greek for goodness is a cray cray word. I'm going to attempt saying it. It's agathosune. Agatha Sune. Agatho Sune. Yeah, why not? That's what sounds pretty much right. I'm probably not, I know I'm not saying it right. But that's the Greek word in the New Testament for goodness. What does this word mean? It means uprightness of heart and life. Uprightness. Uprightness of heart and life. What does uprightness mean? I know you're asking that question. Uprightness means upholding righteousness. Hmm. Upholding it. It's something that you are elevating. It's something that you're holding up. It's something that you are you are saying, this is what it is. You, when you uphold something, you take it and you lift it up. You're upholding it. So uprightness is upholding righteousness. And now you're asking, well, what is righteousness? Righteousness is when you are in right standing with God, living the right way up. I'm giving it to you in simple terms. Living the right way up. I want to explain something to you about righteousness now. At the point of salvation, something amazing happens. So many amazing things happen at the point of salvation. But one of the things that happen at the point of salvation, immediately you are made righteous through Christ Jesus, immediately. So what that means, there's a position change. Before you came to know Jesus, you were classified as a sinner, 
You were far from God. You were separated from God, as a matter of fact. You were basically an orphan away from the Lord. But at the point of salvation, your position changes. You went from being an orphan to becoming a child of God, and you went from being a sinner to being made righteous. There's a position change that happens, and you are declared righteous. I'm going to confirm that for you in Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, you can just jot it down, you're not going to read it. 5, it says, 5 verse 21, it says, we've become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. You've be, you, as you accept Jesus, you become the righteousness of God. Romans 5 verse 1 says, we are made righteous through Jesus. So at the point of salvation, you are made righteous. And we all can say, thank you, Lord. We instantly become in right standing with God. Immediately, you become in right standing with God. So if we go back and look at this definition of what agathosune means, which is uprightness of heart, upholding righteousness, and righteousness is being in right standing with God and living the right way up. You wonder then, why is goodness a fruit of the Holy Spirit if it's something that automatically happens? Well, please take note of what I said there. Righteousness is being in right standing with God, which you are, and living the right way up. Mm. Living the right way up. So with that, what I'm basically saying is, is that being made righteous through Jesus, you are. But that doesn't mean that you automatically live righteously. This has got to be developed through the Holy Spirit. Do you want proof? Of course you do. I can see, I can see through that lens of that camera. You're looking at me with perplexing eyes and you're like, prove it to me. Okay, I will. No problem, sure. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Timothy, what am I saying? 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let me just give you some proof in the pudding here. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says this. Every scripture is God-breathed. Everyone say every scripture. Every, every, scripture. every scripture. Every scripture. Every scripture in God's word is breathed by God. Every scripture is breathed by God, given by his, uh, his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and this is where you need to pay attention, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action. There's a training that needs to happen. In righteousness, in righteous living, training has to happen. So you have been made righteous, your position has changed, you are the righteousness in Christ Jesus, but you still have to be trained in righteousness. You want one more proof? Of course you do, I know you do. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. It says, boys, lads, let no one deceive and lead you astray. He who practices righteousness who is upright, conforming to the divine will and purpose and thought and action, living a consistently cons conscientious life, is righteous, even as he is righteous. But please note what it said there. He who practices righteousness. In this, in this study, Transformed Living, we spoke a lot about this. We spoke a lot about the practicing of something. Practicing is the Greek word praso, which means you've got to practice. It's got to become a ha habit in your life. You do it over and over and over again. It starts becoming a habit in your life. Just like no one has to tell you as, a, as a, 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 an adult woman that you need to brush your teeth because it became a habit when, since you were a child. But I can guarantee you that your mommy or daddy had to tell you when you were small, brush your teeth. <laughs> right? It didn't come naturally to you at that point. So you had to practice it and practice it and practice it. And now that you are an adult, it's something you do automatically without someone saying to you, go brush your teeth. You practice that. Now the word of God is saying the same about practicing righteousness. Saying the same thing. So how do we practice righteousness? Remember, we're talking about goodness here. Goodness, uprightness of heart, upholding righteousness. We're talking about goodness connected to righteousness. How can you practice righteousness? How do you train yourself to Take what God's word says, and when the Holy Spirit prompts you to actually live that way, how is that possible? It is only possible through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit. 
You cannot do it on your own. And that is why people who do not have the Holy Spirit in them, they might know the word, they might know the scripture, you might be a professor in theology or a, 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 a do have your doctorates in theology, but if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be able to put this word in action. The only way to do it is with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, He takes that seed of goodness that's in you and He gets it to start growing to the point where you start living righteously easier. So let's, let's explain this a little bit further. Right, goodness, uprightness of heart and life. Uprightness, upright living. You see, we are, not, we, we are made righteous. But you can choose not to walk in righteousness. Yeah, you can. You made righteous, your positions changed, you're a child of God, but you can still choose to say, I'm not going to do it. That couple that was being stirred by the Holy Spirit to say, You guys need to get married. The, you know, you, you're not doing it according to the word of God. That couple could have said, No, forget that. We're doing it. We've done this forever. God loves us, His grace and mercy you know, covers everything. We're not. We are happy the way we are. They could have done that. They could have chose not to. And when you choose not to walk righteously, it's like your moral compass starts like losing, like, starts losing its little course. Because basically what happens is you stop listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And when you stop listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, you start losing direction and chaos starts happening in your life. Because you keep on banging your head against the wall. The Holy Spirit is like, well, you're going the wrong direction. I'm, I'm trying to show you that's not the way to live. This is the way to live according to God's word. So when we refuse to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, that is when you're refusing to live righteously. Because remember, the Holy Spirit convicts you to righteousness. That's what, what one of the things he does. So goodness, upright living. And when you are living uprightly, that's the evidence of the fruit of goodness in you. So let me give you a very simple example. You find yourself in a situation and a person swears at you. They swear at you in your face. Let's put it that way. It sounds very dramatic. They swear at you in your face. What the fruit of goodness is going to do is going to say, what has happened to me is really horrible. I, I, that's not really nice. But I'm not going to react by swearing back. The fruit of goodness upholds righteousness it is upright living so when goodness is operating inside of you it is not going to retaliate to the anger that's coming from that person that's what that's just that's just one example that I'm giving you because something that we've got to realize being bad is very easy do you all agree with that mm -hmm. it's quite it's quite easy it comes quite mm -hmm. naturally it comes quite naturally to do the wrong thing but through relationship with Jesus, who is our vine, being bad starts becoming very uncomfortable. It's, it actually starts becoming difficult to be bad. Have, have, has this ever happened to you? I'm going to use my mom as an example, because she's a nice example to always use. Has this ever happened to you that you're in the shop and you give somebody um, money to pay for something and they give you too much change, but you've only realized it when you've walked away? Has it ever happened to any of you? Now, what you could say is, oh, God is so good. No. <laughs> no. He just blessed me. Thank you, Jesus. The fruits of goodness in you is going to go, uh uh, you need to take that back. And I remember years ago having this conversation with my mom. I think we were in the car. And I still said, Mom, well, that's a blessing. You're like, no, it's not, my girl. This person's going to suffer. They're going to have to pay out of their wage now. And we had to go back into the shop, and my mom went and returned the money to them. Isn't she a goody two shoes? No, <laughs> no. no I'm, I'm teasing her. But that is goodness. Yeah. That's what goodness does. And that, that's just also another example. You can use so many examples in your life because it's easy to be bad and it's also easy to justify the badness. Mm. Same with this couple. It's easy for them to just carry on doing what they were doing. It would have been very easy to justify that. But they decided because when the Holy Spirit was stirring goodness in them, because what the Holy Spirit does, he leads you to godliness, which is goodness. They made the choice and the decision to do the right thing. Because goodness is upholding righteousness, upholding right living. So when you choose to live rightly 
according to God's word, by the way, of course, we are only talking about the standards of God's word, right? Not according to the standard of the world or social media or what is popular in some shops at the moment. And on. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the standard of God's word. When you're upholding God's word, that's the right way of living. When that happens, then it's very clear that the, that the fruit of goodness is operating on the inside of you. 3 John 1 verse 11 says this. 3 John 1 verse 11 says, He who does good as a way of life is of God. But he who does evil as a way of life does not know God. It's hmm. a tough scripture. Who does evil as a way of life. In other words, let me simplify for you. He who practices good in their life knows God. He is basically dwelling with God. The Holy Spirit is operating in him. When you're practicing goodness as a way of life. But he who practices evil as a way of life. You cannot possibly say you know God. Because if you think about it, when the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and when he's convicting you to righteousness, if you say no to him, he's going to keep on convicting you to righteousness because he's very patient. He's going to keep on doing it over and over and over. And eventually that sin starts becoming so uncomfortable you can't help but to say, I'm sorry God. You can't help it because he keeps on convicting you over and over and over. He doesn't stop. You can choose to totally ignore him. You can. But I can tell you something, when you're choosing to live a life according to God's word, and you are going to church, and you're reading the Bible, and you're singing praise and worship songs, and you're praying, when those moments of prayer, you can try your best to ignore the Holy Spirit. He's going to keep on bringing up that same thing. He's going to say, sweetheart, we've spoken about this. My darling, we need to handle this. You are ignoring this. It's time that you handle this. It's time that you forgive that person. It's time that you stop that fraud in your business. It's time that you stop taking bribes. You know, he, he constantly, he constantly, he constantly leads you to living rightly. That's what he does. But did you see in 3 John 1 verse 11, what I was speaking about, he who does good, does good to me, being righteous, is doing good just like God. So goodness is an action. It's not just about your position. Righteousness, your position has changed, but goodness is an action. It's also an action. So let's just look at one or two things in the, in the word with regards to this. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 says this. I'm just going to paraphrase for you. Jesus went about doing good and healing the sick. There's an and there. So the, the healing is not the doing good part. There's two different things. Jesus went about doing good and healing. That word doing good or that phrase in the Greek is a very also crazy word. E-U-E-R-G-E-T-E-O. Ereo, getio. Something to that effect. But what this word means, it's actually a picture of a philanthropist. Huh? A philanthropist. Someone who financially supports others. Who's a benefactor. Excuse me? So Jesus went about doing good as a philanthropist. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What are we talking about here? This is a teaching for a completely separate day, but let me just summarize it for you here. Many people think Jesus was poor. He was not poor. Jesus had, had quite a substantial financial resource. Do you want me to prove that to you? I will. Luke chapter 8 verse 3 speaks, speaks about how the woman, he lists a whole bunch of women out of interest, it was the woman, who supported Jesus' ministry financially. Yeah, you go read it. Go read the scriptures properly. Go read the scriptures properly. John 12 verse 6 talks about the fact that Judas, the guy who betrayed Jesus, he was the treasurer of Jesus' money. Now, why do you have to have a treasurer if you don't have money? Have you ever thought about that? Jesus had money. That's why he needed a treasurer. He wasn't poor. He wasn't bankrupt. He didn't go around begging. Never did he beg for anything. It's because he had financial resource. As I said, that's a study for another day. Yes, Judas went and betrayed Jesus. Um, he took care of the money, which was like, eh, because he is the one who actually was stealing from the money. Judas was stealing and Jesus knew it. It was all part of the plan, right? We know that. Judas had to do that in order so Jesus could be betrayed, so Jesus could get crucified and die for your and my sin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for that. But Jesus, in the scripture, Jesus went about doing good. He was actually, in that Greek word, doing good, financially supporting others. He was a benefactor. He was a philanthropist. 
Very interesting. Psalm 65 verse 11 says, You crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. Goodness, when you read through the scriptures, often refers to God's gracious generosity. So we're talking here about nine aspects of goodness. It often refers to God's gracious generosity. And the fruit of goodness in our lives is when we reach beyond ourselves to serve and help the needs of other people, practically reaching the needs of other people. So I, when I'm looking at the study and I was really like folk, um, looking at this point and I was milling over it a lot, I'm like, Lord, please just explain this point to me. What are you trying to say here about goodness doing good? What does that actually mean? And I wrote this as a side note to my notes here. This fruit in you, the fruit of goodness in you, will lead you to be generous. Yeah, it will. It will lead you, it will lead and create a generosity in you that maybe was not there before. That's what the fruit of goodness does. It leads you to live a life of being generous, just as Jesus was, just as Jesus did. Interesting. Now, here's another point with regards to goodness that we read in the scriptures. Ephesians 5 verse 9. Ephesians 5 verse 9, I'm not going to read it. But basically what this says is the fruit of this, actually, no, let, me, let me read it. I'm trying to rush for sake of time, and I don't want to do that. It's, I don't ever want to minimize God's word. Ephesians chapter 5, let's go read it. I don't want to paraphrase, let's just look at it. Ephesians 5 and verse 9 from the Amplified Version says this, For the fruit, the effect, the product of the light or the spirit. So it's saying the product of the spirit of God in your life, in every form of kindly goodness, uprightness of heart, and trueness of life. So if we look at that scripture, we break it down. We are looking at goodness, righteousness, because uprightness of heart is righteousness, and truth. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now you know there's that saying that says the good, the bad, and ugly. Well, this scripture is the good, the right, the true. The good, the right, the true. This is the character of God, and it's the essence of who he is, and the scripture speaks about the fruit. So this means that this, the good, the right, the true, becomes the essence of your nature. That's the fruit of goodness. It becomes the essence of your nature. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness is upholding righteousness. What is unrighteousness? What is righteousness? It's living according to God's way. Which is truth. Good, right, true. It's a nice way just to, to uh, I always try to like break it down to make it simple for us to remember so we can keep on remem reminding ourselves what is goodness. Goodness, the goodness, the fruit of goodness in us is good, right, true. Living a life, a life that represents goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's the fruit of goodness. And when we are living this way, then there are certain things in your life that start becoming really, po really possible. Remember I spoke to you about the person who swears at you in your face? Yep, let's go look at Luke chapter 6. This is, I know, one of, I know that this is some of your favorite scriptures. I know you ponder on this scripture and you're like, Lord, let this become my reality. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you know the scripture, you'll understand my, my humor. But I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> Luke chapter 6, verse 27. There you are. Verse 27 says this. But I say to you, all of you who are listening to me, mm -hmm. in order to heed, make it a practice. Make it a practice in your life. Here comes the best part. Yeah, this is the part we love. <laughs> love your enemies. Treat them well. And the Amplified puts this in brackets. Do good to them. Act nobly toward them. To those who detest you and pursue you with hatred. Oh, what a wonderful scripture. Oh, it makes us feel fabulous, doesn't it? Just. Thank you, Mom, for your honesty. No, it doesn't feel good. I hope I don't see people like that. But now we see that we just spoke about my goodness in Ephesians. Goodness is living good, right, and true. Good, right, and true. Good, right, and true. Now we see in Luke, it talks about how we should do good to these people who hate 
me and detest me. What? What? Come on. Really? Well, you see, goodness is, when the fruit of goodness is in operating in your life, you can do that. You can do that because that's what goodness does. Goodness doesn't retaliate to the evil, to the hatred. What goodness does, it will hold up righteousness. It will live rightly up. It's not going to sway back and punch back and whatever. It is going to say, well, this is what my enemy is doing to me. I'm going to do good to them. I'm going to be favorable to them, even to those who detest me. What an incredibly challenging scripture. And then I said to the Lord, kind of what my mom just said now, but in my own words, I kind of, I said to the Lord, that's not fair. Yeah, don't any of you feel that way? Mm -hmm. That's not fair. I want goodness to operate in me. I want, I want the fruit of goodness in me. I want to uphold righteousness. I want to live the right way up. But God, that's not fair. And then God's response to me was, is it fair that my goodness and mercy should follow you all the days of your life, even when you reject me? That was his response to me. And I'm like, huh? Huh? Psalm 23 verse 6 talks about that. Psalm 23 verse 6, 6, 6 says, Surely good, your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Do you know what that actually means? It means that God's goodness, because remember, goodness is his character, which is ultimately being developed in us. God's goodness actively pursues you even when you reject him. His goodness actively pursues you. When we don't deserve it, his goodness actively pursues us. It follows us like this, like a tail. Constantly, wherever we go in our life. And you might try to run away from him, but it's still following you. So that's why he can say to us in Luke chapter 6, you be good to those who hate you. Because God's like, I'm good to you even when you hate me. Do as I do, what the Father says. Imitate me as children do. When the goodness of God, his goodness, his character is in us, we can therefore also show goodness to those who detest us. Sure. That was also just a side note to all of this. So let's summarize all of this. As we dwell in Jesus through the Holy Spirit, the seed of goodness which is already in you, because as you accept Jesus Christ, he puts his seed in you, his DNA in you. That's what 1 Peter, talk, 1 Peter talks about. The seed of goodness in you grows and grows and grows. And eventually, the essence of God, the nature of God, his goodness becomes your nature. And this results in a whole lot of amazing things. One of the things that results in is you start living uprightly easier. Whereas before that sin was comfortable, now it's not so comfortable. You start living uprightly easier. It also means when, the, when goodness is developed in you, you start having a desire to do things God's way. Whereas before you may not have had that desire. Now you desire it. Oh, I just want to do what God wants. But you may have known the Lord for 20 years, but only now there is something stirring within you because you are choosing to abide in Him. So that's what goodness does. Also what goodness does, it includes reaching beyond yourself to serve and help the needs of others through generosity. That's also what goodness does. I'm summarizing for you now. And what the result of goodness in your life, your life starts becoming governed by goodness. So therefore, when you find yourself in a situation where something is just not right, you won't do it. Whereas before you may have done it. Or if you find yourself in a situation that is going against God's word, you run away from it. Whereas before maybe you just entertained it a bit. Goodness in your life leads you to godliness. The fruit of goodness in you will lead you to a point where you want to be more like the character of God. You want to live uprightly. You want to live righteously. That's what goodness does. And it's a fruit. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in us. Isn't that just beautiful? It is beautiful. And it's, it's wonderful because 
as I said a little while ago, you cannot do this on your own. We can't do this on our own. Because there are some things that in God's word that just seem so difficult, like the one I just read, about loving your enemy, and about being kind to them, about doing good for them. That is hard. But when we have the Holy Spirit in us, and He's producing this goodness in us, it starts becoming easier. Now I want to say be gentle with yourself, because maybe this fruit of goodness in your life is still very small, and it needs to grow. So don't give up on it and say, oh, I'm not even close to that. There's no way as I can do that. No, be gentle with yourself. Rather say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you, and I ask you to grow goodness in me. Grow goodness in me. And he does it. As you abide in him. As you abide in him, he grows it within you. Remember the couple. That's a great example all the time. They knew the Lord all the time. Yes, they went away from God. But even when they recommitted their life to the Lord, they carried on living together until they, until they were in the point where they were coming closer and closer to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is the one who was actually bringing the change. I said to a young person a little while ago, not so long ago, and they were talking, sharing something personal with me about an issue in their life, an addiction in their life. And I said to them, stop focusing so much on the addiction and start focusing a whole lot more on Jesus. Because as you elevate Jesus in your life and as you really fall in love with him and as you fall in love with the word and as you spend time in his presence, I can guarantee you that that addiction will start having less of a hold on you. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Because the Holy Spirit stirs the goodness on the inside of you. And eventually now when you want to get involved in that addiction again, and if you want to now press on that computer button and start looking at that thing, you feel a whole lot less you want to do it. And you might still do it, but you start feeling uncomfortable. You're like, oh, okay, I'm not feeling so comfortable right now. And you might still go forth in that sin and you might still do what you did before, but you're not going to be as comfortable in it as you were before. So stop focusing so much on the addiction and start focusing on Jesus. As you abide in him, Galatians 5 verse 22, his presence accomplishes the fruit in your life. His presence accomplishes this. Be in the presence of God and the fruit of goodness starts growing. And eventually now when you want to push on that button on the computer or on your mobile device, suddenly now you're like, I just don't want to do it. Anymore. I just don't want to do it. It starts repulsing you. It starts making you feel gross. Because why? His presence has accomplished goodness, upright living, upholding righteousness in your life. It has become so big inside of you that fruit has grown to the point you cannot ignore it. And that addiction is put away. I guarantee it. Whatever struggle it is in your life, focus on the presence of God and you will see how goodness will prevail over the evil. Goodness always prevails over evil. Now when you read about goodness in the scriptures, you have such a better understanding of it, right? Upholding righteousness, upright living, upright living. Amen. I could go on and on, but let's stop right there. Let's pray, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much that you do this in our lives. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that we cannot do this on our own. And as even as your, your word says, it's not by our might, it's not by our power, it's not by our own abilities, but it's by you, Holy Spirit, that we are able to do this. So Lord, we ask you, we ask you now as your daughters, Holy Spirit, we ask you to grow the fruit of goodness in our lives. We ask you to grow it. We've now sat under your word. You've watered us with your word. We've been washed by your word. And now, Holy Spirit, we ask you to grow it. Grow goodness in our lives. Don't you just want to say that wherever you're watching, however you're listening, in the quietness of your heart, say, Holy Spirit, grow goodness. Grow goodness in me. We thank you, Lord, that Holy Spirit, you do the job. You grow it in us. All we've got to do is be in your presence. So as we are in your presence, 
as we just turn our eyes onto Jesus and as the world grows strangely dim, as the song says, in the light of your glory and grace, I thank you in your presence, Holy Spirit, this is accomplished. In your presence, goodness grows. You produce goodness in us. And we ask you that in the week and the days and the months to come, that goodness, upholding righteousness, will start becoming the essence of our character and the essence of our living. So everything that we do in our lives will be governed by goodness, doing things God's way. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence and we thank you that you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. And amen.